Coming up on Triangulation, I speak with Arthur Holland Michelle. He's the author of the book Eyes in the Sky. It's all about surveillance from the sky. And that's up next on Triangulation. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 404, recorded Monday, June 24th, for Friday, June 28th, 2019. Arthur Holland Michelle, Eyes in the Sky. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Triangulation. I'm Jason Howell. This is the show where we sit down with people writing and and just spending their lives uh, kind of diving into specific topics of technology and picking them apart, things you may have thought of things also that you may not be thinking of actively, then you realize it's up there looking down upon you. And that's what we're going to talk about today. If that sounds ominous, that's because I'm setting up a very, I would say an ominous, ominous topic, Gorgon Stare. And if that doesn't kind of make you wonder, okay, what's going on there? Uh, our author today, Arthur Holland Michelle, founder and co-director of the Center of uh, for the Study of the Drone, also a researcher and journalist. He is the author of this book, Eyes in the Sky, The Secret Rise of Gorgon Stare, and how it will watch us all. See, I told you it was ominous. How are you doing? I'm very well. Good to be here, Jason. <laughs> it is great to have you on. Um, I, I saw the the kind of the summary for this book when we were looking into kind of booking for the show, and almost immediately I knew it was right down my alley because technology right now is in this really crazy, crazily rapidly paced place where everything is developing out almost so fast that nobody can really get a sense of like whether it's a good idea or not. And, and I don't know, maybe this falls into that category. Uh, as we talk about it, we can certainly dive into that. But before we kind of get into the the topics of, of the book that you've written here, uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about drones because this really seems to be you know, a large part of, of why maybe this topic came across you know, as something you wanted to write about, but you have a rich history with drones. Tell us a little bit about your background sure. in drones. Sure. So uh, in 2012, I was uh, an undergraduate uh, between my uh, junior year and my senior year at Bard College, which is a small liberal arts school in, uh, in the Hudson Valley, about two hours north of New York City. Uh, I was a history student, actually. Um, what I was studying had absolutely nothing to do with drones. Um, and it was the summer uh, going into my senior year, and I was thinking a lot about this technology. Every morning I would sit in the cafeteria and read the New York Times and invariably there'd be a story about drones either being used for drone strikes in places like Pakistan and Somalia and Yemen, which of course raises all kinds of interesting uh, legal and ethical questions. There was also a lot of talk about drones being used domestically for uh, any number of civilian applications. Uh, all of which to me seemed so urgent and fascinating and mysterious. And the story is I was actually sitting in a bar uh, with a friend and suddenly I realized that I wanted to study this topic. And not only did I realize that, I wanted to study it at Bard College using the college's very sort of liberal arts, interdisciplinary approach to complex issues. And Sitting in that bar that very day, I even came up with the name. I wanted to have a center for the study of the drone at Bard College. And um, the rest is sort of history. I, I, I returned in my senior year. I, I worked with, um, actually, it turns out my, my freshman year uh, roommate, Dan Gettinger, who was doing his senior research about drones, uh, some faculty. We set up this little sort of project, and it, if you'll pick, forgive the pun, took off. And uh, by the time I graduated in 2013, um, we had sort of gained enough attention or notoriety that we, um, we, we, we continued on it. And that was six years ago. And um, I continue to be fascinated by the topic. We have had the opportunity to research a whole range of really fascinating issues around military drone use and domestic drone use and sometimes the intersection of the two. Um, and and that is partly what gave rise to the book. I you know I, in this job I spend a lot of time, thinking about and writing about uh, pretty scary and troubling technologies, um, hellfire missiles for example, predator drones, reaper drones, uh, 
the drone swarm. But in a way, nothing um, sort of fascinated me and in a way kept me up at night the way Gorgon Stair did. Um, and you, you'll find out why in a moment when we get into what Gorgon Stair actually is. Um, and so that was what gave rise to, to writing uh, this, this book. Uh, and in your work leading up to this book, had you ever like had the thought of like constructing uh, a, a book around a particular topic, becoming an author? Has that had that been something yeah, that's kind yeah. of on your radar? I know you you know you've got you've got hooks in, in being a journalist as well, writing for certain sure. publications and everything. But sure, I mean it was always a question of whether I, the right topic came up. Yeah, you know, I right. I never wanted to write a book just for the sake of writing a book. Uh, a number of people had approached me and sort of floated the idea that um, perhaps it would be a good idea for me to write a book. Uh, but I didn't want to rush it. I, I thought, well, I'll write a book when I have something to write a book about, if you will. And it's actually funny. Um, the idea for this book, the idea to write about Gorgon Stare and all the other associated technologies and what it means for us and our future, occurred to me when I was sort of in that strange semi asleep state lying in bed and i woke up and sort of sat bolt upright and in that moment i i knew that i i, I had to write a book about this topic that you know hell or high water it was it was it was going to happen and i was lucky enough to get that opportunity and um and here we are yeah in that moment you you your eyes opened up and you realized wait a minute they're watching me i should write about yeah. that uh, I already knew that they were watching me, but yeah. then it really struck me that <laughs> perhaps I should say something about it. <laughs> Absolutely. And you've constructed just a wonderful kind of piece uh, that walks through a lot of really interesting kind of pictures. Because when you think of of like this omnipresent eye in the sky looking down, able to track both, you know, time and space, essentially, like basically covering all of this ground, being able to go back in time to track, a, let's say, a crime from this point back in the past to, you know, originating over here. When you think about that stuff, I mean, it's just, it's it's incredible what your mind can come up with as far as what that looks like. So thankfully, you've, you've kind of provided some some imagery to, to associate with this. But I wonder about sourcing because, you know, so much of this, a, lo a lot of this feels very much like a government agency that, you know, that no one knows of and no one talks of. And I mean, obviously there's information out there, but how did you, uh, how did you kind of make those connections to source? The sure. Book. sure. So um, this technology is um, a technology that was publicly known uh, prior to me writing the book. Uh, people, um, there had been a few articles here and there about um, Gorgon Stare and other uh, systems like it. Um, but it was kind of funny. I had the idea to write the book um, before really contemplating what it would be mean to actually write a book. That is to say, speaking to people who generally are not particularly disposed to speaking to the press. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, when I, um, when I went around people I know in the sort of DC think tank community, the, uh, the sort of tech journalism community, and said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm writing a book about uh, wide area motion imagery and Gorgon Stare, invariably the the, the question that came back to me was, are these guys going to talk to you? <laughs> um, funnily enough, though, um, access wasn't really a problem. Hmm. In, in a way, everyone who spoke to me was very willing to speak to me. Um, and that, that surprised me a bit. Uh, and there was a very clear reason for that. Um, everyone believes that this is an important story. Everyone believes that there is something of uh, greater importance uh, that goes to the public good, uh, that, that raises questions about our future that need to be asked, and not just in the context of uh, military operations, but also in the, the civilian context, in the domestic context. Um, we all understand at an intuitive level the idea of privacy and the importance of privacy. And that even goes for people who are developing technologies that are meant to, in one way or another, intrude upon privacy. Um, one, uh, one fellow I spoke to, when I finally did reach him, I mean, 
it should be noted, some of these folks are very hard to, to find. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one of these guys, when I, um, when I did ultimately reach him, he said that he had been waiting for this call for 15 years. Hmm. Um, and actually, he wasn't the only one who said something to that effect. And when I asked him why, he said, because in a way, we, we need to answer for what we've done. You know, we, we, we have created something and now it's out there and now there has to be a discussion. Um, so in a sense, that was a, that was a, a huge sort of a blessing for my yeah. journalistic process. Um, and it, it allowed me to have some really honest and sincere conversations with people who are really at the heart of the topic. Yeah, that's interesting. Kind of takes some of the weight off your shoulders to almost you know, almost feel permission to explore this deeper, uh, that the people mm-hmm. that have created it feel this way as well. At the same time, technology like this is kind of inevitable, or maybe it's dangerous to assume that it's inevitable, but I mean, as to- technology has progressed... I mean, so many doors have opened that never would have been possible or even, you know, uh, conceivable 15, 20 years ago. Yet here we are, we're carrying miniature pocket uh, you know, computers that are sure. so, so powerful and so capable, let alone what, what uh, you know, what organizations are, are putting up into the sky to, to monitor down mm-hmm. on the ground. Technology prices are dropping. Um, sure. So, you know, every year, year after year, this, the same, uh, this the same approach, the same use of that technology becomes easier and less less costly to implement. Yeah. So it's just a matter of time. It's basically inevitable at that point. If they hadn't done no, it, somebody absolutely. else would have. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the, my motivations with this book was not just to talk about what has already happened, what has already been developed, but to probe into where we're going. Mm-hmm. You know, what these recent uh, advances mean about the future of privacy and the the future of uh, government intrusion and uh, whether we should perhaps take action on on some of those trend lines uh, before it's before it's too late and you're absolutely right i mean i found a lot of evidence that everything that you just mentioned miniaturization uh dropping price points the technology itself just becoming more powerful um is all happening with this very technology and as that happens something that was really a niche previously uh you know something that was only used in a very limited set of constrained military uh missions now has broad um public accessibility and as a result there is even greater urgency Mm -hmm. for us to to speak about it shoot at some point we could all have our own little (laughs) eyes in the sky yeah who who the heck knows i mean technology is democratizing everything so who the heck knows who's to say that 20 years down the line we won't all be surveilling everyone uh on our on our own little systems um Obviously, it, it's hard to to talk about this topic and not start at the very beginning of this story, which kind of you know kind of puts a smile on my face because I remember the movie Enemy of the State. I remember yeah. that it was I haven't watched it any time since like it came out, so I can't necessarily remember if it's historically good, but I remember liking it at the time. Um, oh no, it's it's actually a pretty good movie. Is I it? Mean, I should I'd watch it again. It. Yeah, go ahead. I, I it, it's not <laughs> two hours badly spent by any stretch of imagination. <laughs> well, that's good because I'm sure you've watched it a couple of times to get a sense of like how fiction can lead to, you know, to creating the future essentially. And that's exactly what happened here. Right. Talk about, talk a little bit about how enemy of the state actually has something very critical to do with what we have with Gorgon stare. Sure. So, um, when I started doing research about this, this technology, um, which, you know, we'll get a little bit more into what it does in a second, but, very briefly, it, it watches a very, very wide area from the sky, essentially. Um, people often used an analogy to uh, explain what it looked like and how it worked, which is to say, have you seen the movie Enemy of the State? Uh, because that's sort of the closest analog, uh, this, the closest visual reference to what this technology actually does. Now, to give you a sort of plotted 
potted uh, summary of Enemy of the State. It's a 1998 movie with Will Smith and Gene Hackman. And in the movie, uh, w- Will Smith plays a lawyer in Washington, D.C., who comes into possession of some evidence that um, compromises, in a sense, uh, a number of officials at the National Security Agency. Uh, and so they decide they need to get it back. And they begin to pursue him relentlessly uh, using all sorts of spy gadgets, uh, some of which were real at the time and some of which were entirely fictional. They tap his phones, obviously. They plant miniature cameras in uh, his house. There's one in his smoke detector. Uh, They put trackers in his watch and his pen and his pants and his shoes. Um, Their most powerful tool, though, without a doubt, uh, is their surveillance satellite. Uh, They basically get this giant satellite, park it over the eastern seaboard, and it stares down on the entire area. Uh, it seems like it looks at really the whole, you know, the whole eastern seaboard in a sense. And it watches Dean, the lawyer played by Will Smith, as he scuttles around trying to get away. Um, now, for the average viewer, the... Uh, the intent with that 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 device was to spark fear and anxiety. Uh, it was meant to demonstrate that, you know, while power is nothing new and the abuse of power is nothing new, these new technologies, these new surveillance technologies in particular, make power all the more vicious and even further rig the contest between the weak and the strong. And... Certainly, watching the satellite tracking Will Smith around, really seeming like he has nowhere to go, is is pretty terrifying. Well, one night in 1998, shortly after the movie came out, uh, on a Friday evening um, in in Northern California, uh, a man uh, who works uh, for a uh, a government lab called the Lawrence Livermore uh, National Laboratory uh, was attending. Uh, a screening of this movie with his wife on a, on a date night. And whereas the other members of the audience were no doubt terrified by what they saw, he was thrilled. He saw this satellite and said, That's a good idea. we've got to do this, essentially. <laughs> I mean, we uh, that would be amazing. And so he rushed home. Uh, and picked up the phone and left a message with his supervisor. And the message was very short. He just said, I have a great idea. Call me. And as a result of that initial call, uh, this initially this very small um, kind of scrappy group um, – within this very large organization started exploring this idea. You know, if we were to do something like that, how would we go about it? What technologies would we would we use? Um, and then a few years later, uh, after the uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan had, had really heated up and U.S. service members were coming under constant attack from improvised explosive devices, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency became very interested in the technology um, because they saw it as a way of countering these insurgent networks in Iraq uh, who blended seamlessly into the local uh, population. And from that point on, it's just been a roller coaster ride for this technology. I mean, it was rushed to deployment uh, by 2006, and it has been operating in uh, foreign wars ever since. Gorgon Stare is the ultimate iteration of the technology. It is the most powerful one to date, uh, but there are dozens of other systems that have been developed or are indeed still out there. Um, But it all began, as you say, with the 1998 thriller Enemy of the State with Will Smith. It's like six degrees of Will Smith, basically. Yeah, uh, absolutely. As as relates to surveillance. Uh, That might be the only time that actually works, but anyways. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, How how developed was the technology in the beginning? Like, Like, I'm kind of imagining... It's the sort of thing where if you've got a camera covering a wide area and this, you know, this started development as early as it did, 
you're not you're not talking like seeing the details of a car down on a street. You're talking like a couple uh, of pixels moving around and like that's the car that we're following. Is that about what yeah. it was in the beginning? Yeah, absolutely. And to be sure, um, the the idea with this technology is to watch the widest possible area. Right. And so with that in mind, it doesn't matter if a car is only a couple of pixels because what you want to do is you want to track cars and vehicles uh, where they're going and also backwards in time to where they've been from, uh, where they've come from rather. And um, so, yes, you're very much right. It's not going to give you this perfectly crisp image where you can, you know, watch a car, read its number plate or recognize a person's face. But you just pass the coordinates of that vehicle that you've tracked and have decided is potentially a threat over to another camera more like a sort of telescopic camera, if you will, and it'll be able to do that job extremely uh, extremely well. So the basic concept with uh, these cameras um, is that you have a, an IED explosion, so a car bomb goes off somewhere in Baghdad. Um, if you have the camera flying overhead at the time, you can rewind the footage and zoom in into the footage uh, to that very point in time where the explosion happened. Uh, then you can wind, rewind even further to see where the people involved in that attack came from. Not only that, you can also uh, sort of move forward in the footage to see where they went. Um, now, the idea is that Eventually, the folks involved in that kind of attack will return to a safe house, some location that is associated with this terrorist group. Now that you know the location of this safe house, you can watch the other cars coming and going from that exact place. In theory, once you have connected enough locations by tracking the vehicles moving between them, you can figure out, uh, as as one uh, as one intelligence, uh, what former intelligence officer put it to me, you'll start to see that patterns emerge. And in theory, you'll be able to figure out what the hierarchy of the organization is, who plays which role, how they're all connected. And that's certainly catnip for someone like, uh, you know, an intelligence official at the Central Intelligence Agency. Yeah. They're not trying to, you know, put steel plating on the bottom of Humvees to explo to, to to prevent deaths from explosions as they happen in the moment. They want to stop the next attack. They want to find the people responsible. Maybe find the people responsible and extract further information uh, from them. And that was the precisely the idea with this. And it was so revolutionary because previously aerial surveillance cameras operated more like telescopes. You could see your target on the ground in very high fidelity, but you could only watch a very narrow area. And so if something happened outside of your frame of view, you had no way of capturing it. You had to sort of, you know, rely on 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 dumb luck. Uh, one anecdote that uh, was given to me was that uh, a predator with one of these telescopic cameras was being used to follow a convoy of vehicles, and there was intelligence to say that there was a senior terrorist leader inside one of these vehicles, but they didn't know exactly which one. At one point, these vehicles reached an intersection and split up. And now, those watching had to make a pretty sort of stomach-churning decision. Do we go left or do we go right? Ultimately, it was basically a, a sort of flip of the coin, and they got it wrong. Now, if you were using one of these wide area cameras, you'd be watching the whole city. So it didn't matter if you go right or left. The camera records, as one uh, engineer put it to me, the whole thing all the time. Uh, you can see everything, and so that problem of the telescopic camera no longer exists. And that problem, uh, I think, I believe you you talk about in the book, is the so soda straw problem, kind of looking yeah, through. Yeah, it's got this curious name, the, the soda straw problem. <laughs> but but exactly very sure. illustrative, like that, that definitely drives the point home. Yeah, it's like looking through a, a soda straw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's all you're going to see. And I envision that technology like this, you know, b based on how it's it's progressed 
already, and based on how just the 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 rapid rate at which camera technology is progressing, that at some point we're going to have the wide area coverage that also enables some sort of narrow field of view, high resolution sort of detail. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are already uh, aerial systems out there that will have one wide area camera to watch the entire city. And then when that wide area system detects uh, a target of interest somewhere, um, say, uh, you know, a vehicle doing something a little bit unusual on the side of the road, it can pass those coordinates over to the soda straw camera uh, for a closer look. This is called cross queuing. And um, it's certainly very possible. Uh, and not only from one camera to another camera, there are systems that have a wide area camera and a listening device or a cell phone locating device so that you uh, detect uh, some suspicious activity in one part of the city and then you cue the, 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 the cell phone interceptor uh, and that will, in theory, give you a lock on the identity of whoever... Uh, you're looking at. So um, in a way, you're right to say that that combination of different capabilities is what really gives you the, the sort of all-seeing view of the ground. Sure. So this is a lot of uh, a lot of interesting technology intersecting here. It's it's not just cameras. There's also intelligence built into this, right? Is there? There's the ability to track certain objects and and that sort of stuff. AI. Oh, you know, all, absolutely. All that stuff. Yeah. So when these cameras were initially um, initially deployed, um, the way the footage was analyzed is that. You know, you saw an explosion go off uh, and you zoomed in into the footage and then you'd have human analysts who would literally have to stare at the footage uh, and track manually the vehicles as they moved around. As you can imagine, that's very labor intensive and very tedious. And also, these cameras simply create far more data than human eyes could possibly process, even if you have huge teams. Um, so very quickly, uh, there was a realization within the community that this needed to be automated, that the technology would be so much more effective if you could essentially just click on a vehicle of interest on the screen and then have the computer show you everywhere that vehicle has been oh boy. and everywhere it's going. Um, not only that, though, that was sort of the first stage. Um, the next stage was to say, well, instead of having to know the suspicious vehicle ahead of time, what if the computer could tell us who is suspicious? What if the computer could detect activities that we would have to search for manually? Uh, for example, uh, it, it was pretty clear after a few years of the war in uh, Iraq and then, uh, and, and then sort of later as IEDs became a big problem in Afghanistan, that vehicles that were involved in attacks like ambushes or, 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 or suicide bombings often exhibited very similar behaviors in the lead up to an attack. They might um, drive aimlessly or they might do a, a U-turn in an unusual place um, with an eye to, um, you know, dropping anybody who might be following them. And so, in theory, if you trained an, an automated analysis system to tell you every time a vehicle in the city does a suspicious U-turn, then uh, the hardest part of the job is actually done for you. And, in theory, you don't have to wait for the attack to happen. You can prevent the crime uh, before it's even occurred. And there is a movie about that too. It's called uh, Minority Report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, and that's where it starts to kind of that, that fuzzy, blurry line uh, between mm -hmm. implementing technology to prevent, you know, some big catastrophe from happening and potentially, you know, invading someone's privacy or at least their their perception of privacy. But this is all happening out in the open, right? Like it, it and it, isn't it true that if something's happening out in the open, it's kind of fair game as far as 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 far as tracking, or am I getting that completely wrong? 
Uh, in terms of sort as, of legally? As far as, yeah, legally, surveillance, that sort of thing. I mean, obviously, yeah. in the home is different. But if it's out there, is, is that why this is so easily done? Sure. So so to backtrack just a tiny bit, yeah. um, after the technology was deployed in foreign wars, it really wasn't long until the groups involved in uh, developing the technology started really looking to the home front yes. uh, and thinking about all the different potential applications in U.S. skies, specifically uh, law enforcement being a key uh, example. And um, so there have over the years been a great number of efforts to equip law enforcement departments all over the country with this, uh, this particular capability, which would raise the question, is any of this legal? I mean, this stuff sounds pretty formidable. This stuff sounds like it could really, you know, do some pretty incredible things and intrude upon our privacy in some pretty, uh, pretty startling ways. Fourth Amendment um, issues, all that, yeah. Yeah, sure. Years. Well, as it turns out, it's perfectly legal. Um, in fact, I myself have operated one of these cameras while I was reporting. I I, I flew up in uh, in an air in an airplane uh, equipped with one of these cameras over the city of Albuquerque, and I surveilled the people of that city. I I swung the camera around. I watched huge neighborhoods all at once. I tracked individual vehicles. I could see ch students exercising at the University of New Mexico campus. Um, the reason this is all legal is because the air is public space. It's like a public park or it's like a sidewalk or a road. And you have a First Amendment right to capture images from public space. I'll give you an example. If you are um, walking down a street, say, and it's nighttime, and you walk past a house and the window is open and the lights are on indoors and you see something illegal happening inside, say, um, say a murder. Uh, you haven't intruded upon anybody's privacy by walking down the street and just happening to turn your eyes in a particular direction and witnessing an illegal activity. Now, if you take a, a video or an image of that incident and pass it onto the police, you also haven't committed a crime. You're exercising both your First Amendment right and also your right to pass information along to the um, to the police. The same goes if, if it's the law enforcement agencies that are using the technology. Uh, say there is a police officer, again, just walking a beat down the street, and uh, there is a, a backyard to a property with a very high fence, but the gate is open, and the police officer is able to see from the sidewalk that there is a large cannabis plantation inside this uh, inside this property <laughs> they can't unsee what they've just seen and if they want they can take a photograph of that um if they want to act on it in that very moment they can go to the person and say you know i've, I've seen something that is a probable cause for uh, uh you know for uh, for a search i do not need a warrant as such and they would be within their rights to act upon that the crazy thing is that the sky is exactly the same. When you take a, a photo from the window of an airplane when you're flying cross-country, say, you, you, you're not doing anything illegal. You're not violating anybody's privacy. And as far as the law is concerned, there is no difference between sticking an iPhone out of the window of, a, of a, an airplane on a commercial flight and flying one of these giant military-grade cameras over a city uh, watching thousands of people simultaneously. That... Yeah, that's so interesting to me, right? Because, I mean, obviously, pointing a camera outside of an airplane when you're on a flight and taking a picture of a, of a, of a landscape or a cityscape, obviously, that to me, that isn't any sort of, you know, there's, there's no potential for abuse there. It's a picture. Oh. What can you really do with that? You're just staring at a picture. Having, like, potentially 24-7 surveillance and being able to, like, pick apart patterns of people's movements around. I mean, when we think about location tracking on phones, people get all up in arms about the fact that someone on the other side of that data connection might be able to see that I've gone, you know, to the gym and then to the grocery store or whatever, and they shouldn't, they shouldn't have that 
that insight into my movements if it's data that we're talking about. But if it's full, you know, full imagery of an entire space and all of this can be rewound and fast forwarded, like it, it just, in my mind, it seems like one of those instances where maybe the law and technology, like they're, they're progressing at different rates and, and maybe oh, the, you know, the laws are, are tied to something older, not something in, in the current scape. No, Jason, that's exactly what uh, what what happened in this case. Those those rules, or rather the sort of lack of rules that I'm I'm talking about, um, were developed at a time when a technology like this was completely unfathomable. Yeah. Um, you know, at the time when these legal precedents were established, uh, it was very expensive and very difficult to get an eye in the sky, and if you did your capabilities were, in a way, somewhat limited. Um, nowadays, not only do we have these incredible military-grade cameras that can watch an area persistently for hours on end, tracking thousands of vi vehicles and people simultaneously, you can also go on Amazon and buy a drone for $1,000. And with that drone, you can shoot it right up from your backyard and get a pretty commanding view of, say, your neighbor's backyard. And if your neighbor happens to be doing something private in that space, well, it's, and I know this sounds strange to say it, their fault for not protecting themselves properly from aerial observation, rather than your fault for simply legally flying a drone where you are allowed to fly a drone as long as you're abiding by all the rules set for, you know, operating drones in the airspace system. Not your problem their problem. Now, it gets a little bit fuzzy if you, you know, take a very close-up image of your neighbor and then publish right. it and do all sorts of things with it. Depending on the state, that may raise different privacy issues. But at a federal level, as far as the, the, the sort of uniform law of the land goes, you know, it's, it's fair game if it's seen uh, from the sky. Um, so... Uh, there is a really strong sense, uh, and it is a sense that I would share, that perhaps it's time to revisit some of these rules. Mm. Perhaps it's time to say, while that worked for us in the past, things have changed and we need to catch up to the reality that aerial observation is not what it once was. Yeah, absolutely. Now you got to try to outrun the system, right? Yeah, you got to be yeah. <laughs> try and lose it, uh, yeah, lose it successfully as well. <laughs> was the tracking automatic, or was it someone following you? Um, kind of. It, yeah. Uh, more so um, out in in New Mexico, I sort of pitted myself head to head against one of these uh, cameras. Uh, uh, the engineer, he. Took it up, was orbiting 10,000 feet uh, above our heads. Um, I radioed him and said that we were going to drive to um, this this Walmart that was uh, a few miles away, and I bet him a beer that he couldn't keep eyes on us the whole way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, in a way, it wasn't a, a hugely exciting race uh, just because we were so outclassed. I mean, you know, he was able to watch miles and miles of, of terrain in a pretty sparsely populated area. We tried a little bit of counter surveillance. We took a somewhat unusual route to get to the Walmart, thinking that he might not be expecting that. But uh, once we um, once we parked in the parking lot, I radioed him and he was like, yep, yeah, I know exactly where you are. He, he told me where we were and what our surroundings looked like. Uh, you know, the... I really got a sense for the first time how truly in inescapable the technology can be. I mean, I really did feel incredibly powerless. Yeah. You know, if I had got back in the car and driven 20 miles in another direction, he he would have he would have followed us there and it wouldn't have been hard because he sees this wide area and if perhaps he had failed to see me the entire way, uh, he still had all this footage, and so he could have looked at it after the fact and found out where I uh, 
where I had ended up. Um, that afternoon, he sent all the footage to a team at the University of Missouri that has developed a very effective tracking algorithm. And uh, then they sent me uh, a, a video showing how their robotic eye, if you will, had been able to follow me everywhere I, uh, everywhere I rent, went with this giant sort of... Um, green uh, blob over my head indicating my position at all times and um, and that's that, that was even more eye-opening because now we didn't have to rely on a, a fallible human being we we could use uh, cold hard algorithmic logic to um, to keep me in in sights at, uh, at, at all times and these are taking into account the the mapping of a particular area as well, right? Can it line up particular mapping data with what it sees down below so it knows that when you go into this tunnel, you're going to come out that point over there, that sort of stuff? Oh, absolutely. So you can overlay a Google map onto this data very easily. Yeah. And so you're now able to see the names of the streets that your target is driving along. Wow. So say you are communicating with a patrol car on street level uh, and you want to have that car intercept. Well, you say, uh, okay, Arthur is driving along Elm Street and he just took a right on Oak Street and it seems like he is heading to, uh, you know, First Avenue. And, um, you know, that is all the information you need to make uh, an interception. And not only that. Say you do lose sight of your target because they pass under a particularly large tree, if you will, or behind a skyscraper. Um, well, in modern life, we are already watched in so many different ways. In a city, chances are you're already being watched in one place or another by a CCTV camera. So if you do have one of those gaps, you can cross-check the location and the exact time against the CCTV feed. And if you're lucky, and chances are you will be, you'll be able to pick up the scent right back. And in that regard, the you know, the, the technology is all the more inescapable. Um, I certainly saw that being used in Baltimore, uh, where the most extensive uh, program to surveil a city uh, has taken place so far. This was uh, a law enforcement program in Baltimore in 2016, and I sat in on a murder investigation where uh, a camera was used to track the suspects who had been involved in this murder, both backwards in time to where they'd come from and forwards in time to where they went. And the, the, the analysts made extensive use of the city's very dense network of CCTV cameras, not only to pick up, you know, the, the slack between any sort of uh, gaps in the aerial footage, but also to identify the kind of car that they were driving. Uh, at, at, at one point, uh, they... Um, uh, they were able to determine that this particular silver Chevy Cruze that they were interested in had what appeared to be a white piece of paper sort of uh, on the dashboard visible for, uh, through the windscreen. <laughs> and so even though you didn't have the license plate number of this vehicle, you had a great deal of identifying information. There probably weren't all that many late model Chevy Cruises, silver color, driving around Baltimore with a white piece of paper on the dash. Once you put out that information to squad cars, um, you have a pretty good chance of, of finding that person. And to be sure, that could be a good thing because maybe you're finding them before they do something else terrible. Yeah. And that combination right there really kind of addresses what we were talking about earlier with the soda straw problem. It, it, that, that example right there in 2016 is the wide area camera, less resolution you know, and then, you know, zoom into the kind of the closer cameras of the C, the, the CCTV. Yeah, exactly. And you've got the close up footage that you need to get the details. Uh, that's mm -hmm. fascinating. Now, Baltimore, um, from reading through the book, many people didn't know about this. They didn't know that this aerial footage was being, was happening. Uh, mm -hmm. Ross McNutt, I, I believe, is the tech entrepreneur who is, who yeah. is, and is still, 
kind of, you know, yep. the, the foundationally trying to get this effort going in a number of different cities. How come so many people didn't know that this was even happening in Baltimore before Bloomberg kind of blew the lid off of it? Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's very simple, actually. Um, it was not funded by the city. So there was a, um, a billionaire philanthropist called uh, from Texas called um, uh, John Arnold. And he has a foundation that supports experimental, uh, potentially transformative law enforcement technologies. Um, and he approached uh, Ross McNutt, who runs this company, Persistent Surveillance Systems, which markets this wide area of surveillance technology to domestic law enforcement, and said, if you can find a city that would be willing to take a chance on this technology, we will fund the program. And... Um, he came back to them very quickly and said Baltimore would probably be interested. As it turned out, Baltimore was interested. Ross McDonald had been speaking to them for a long time. And they set up a program. Because it was uh, funded from outside the city budget, there was, at least according to their legal analysis, no reason to seek approval for this program from the city administration. So uh, prior to setting up this surveillance operation, the Baltimore Police Department did not inform the city council. It did not inform the mayor. It did not inform the state attorney general. It uh, did not inform the public de defender. It didn't inform uh, civil society. Uh, in fact, I happened to uh, speak to uh, Ross McNutt right in the middle of the operation and he invited me to come down to see what they were doing, uh, but only on the condition that I not tell a single soul about where I was going and why I was going there and what was happening in the city. Um, and so I spent two truly, truly incredible and in a way troubling days in the city of uh, of baltimore inside the operations center watching the entire city i mean this camera was able to capture 32 square miles of the city wow. all at once and um it it was truly incredible what they were able to do with it. I mean, they developed leads on all sorts of unsolved crimes. They were able to help police cap uh, capture individuals who had been involved in violent assaults. Um, but there was something disconcerting about the whole experience, and it very much had to do with the fact that this was a secret. After I left uh, the operations center, on the last day, um, Russ McNutt asked me once again to uh, not tell anybody about this operation until, you know, until he had given me the green light, so to speak. Um, and I stepped out onto the street and I looked up sort of instinctually uh, to try and see this aircraft that was watching us. Um, I couldn't see the airplane, but I intensely felt its presence. I knew that it was there and I knew that it was watching me. And that alone was troubling enough. Um, but then I looked around at all the people just going about their business on the street. Mm. And they had no idea. They had no idea that they were being watched by a technology that many of them probably didn't even know existed. And that did not feel right to me. That felt like a, a bit of a miscarriage of justice, if you will. This technology watches everybody, and so surely it's, it's, everybody's, uh, it's everybody's business. Um, and then, as you mentioned, uh, there was uh, an article in Bloomberg um, about the program. Uh, that article came out, I believe, in August, and uh, there was so much outrage in the city uh, not only among the general population, but also among the city administrators that the Baltimore Police Department was ultimately forced to close down the uh, the initiative. Um, so their lack of transparency had sort of uh, 
come back round to bite them, if you will. I should also note that even during the operation, Ross McNutt had told me that he was very uncomfortable with the city's decision to keep it a secret. Um, he felt like it should be public information, not only because that would be the more democratic way to go about it, but also because he thought it would be more effective if would-be murderers and you know, other criminals uh, knew that this technology was flying over their heads, maybe they would uh, think twice <laughs> before committing a crime. Uh, but he allowed the city in a way to make that ultimate decision. It wasn't his decision uh, to to keep it secret or to or to release the information, and and so uh, and so there it is. As you mentioned, he remains very active. Yes, uh, he continues to try and push the technology. Uh, he announced uh, just last week that he uh, is in talks with um, the city of St. Louis and uh, also is hoping to get the technology over Chicago. Um, and uh, he has said that if that happens, the city's residents will not only be informed, they will be brought into the process. They will have you know, town hall meetings so that uh, the public can be heard this time around. But there's definitely a trust layer that would have to be rebuilt there. Um, going back to what you said as far as like the ever-present, you know, camera in the sky being a deterrent for crime just makes me, you know, realize also or I'm reminded of the fact that these CCTV cameras are everywhere, have been everywhere for a very long time. That doesn't really seem to <laughs> make much of a difference. I think when someone's conducting a crime, I imagine... I imagine they're not thinking very much about that. They're they're you know passionately thinking about whatever is motivating them to conduct the crime in the first place. So, but but and then the negative connotation of that on the other side is all the innocent people living their lives, assuming that uh, I'm not doing anything wrong, but you know basically questioning every move they make because who knows at what point that this particularly innocent act could in in a future lens be seen as something different or whatever and oh, sure, just makes sure. it you know you live your life differently when you know you're under yeah. a lens 24 7. i mean i'd also argue that there is a, a crucial difference with with regards to uh cctv um you know <laughs> A CCTV camera is not going to follow you home. Yeah, yeah. So you might commit a crime and the police might be able to get a pretty grainy picture of you, uh, but they're not going to find out where you live. And certainly CCTV uh, can provide all sorts of leads, but it's on a whole different scale when you talk about having an all-seeing eye in the sky. There's Very also, true. in a way, something so much more tangible and almost spooky about being watched from above. Uh, maybe just because it's unfamiliar. Um, you know, I, I found this Pentagon document that talked about the purpose of wide area surveillance being not only to, you know, do the work of aerial surveillance, which is to, you know, find the enemy, uh, figure them out, but also to give the enemy the impression that you not only know what they're doing, but you know what they are going to do next to, as the report puts it, you know, make sure that the enemy is looking over their shoulder at all times. But as you say, uh, while that may be well and good for for criminals, um, do we want to have that impression about our non-criminal activities? Um, do Do you think that we would attend? protests for a political cause if we knew that the police could potentially track us back to our homes would we uh, go to certain example. places of you know would we go to certain places of worship uh, if we felt like we were being followed from from above uh, this is something known as the chilling effect mm -hmm. uh, and it is one of the subtler but ultimately one of the most dangerous potential consequences of of pervasive surveillance is that we don't want to live in a world where absolutely all of our decisions are made in the context of whether or not we're being watched. I mean, that's the whole nature of privacy 
is that we have a right to do things without being watched, and that is sacrosanct. I mean, that is even, you know, key to feeling happy and pursuing your dreams. Um, so there is a significant uh, danger in, in that respect, and um, it's something that we, we probably need to think about pretty hard, right? Yeah, especially because we have, you know, there are examples that exist in this world that are, you know, of, of uh, you know, places like China who are un engulfed yeah. in surveillance and the effect that that can have on the citizens. And is that a model? Is that where we're headed? Would you consider China to be a fully fused city in that regard that, that you talk about? Uh, well, you know. Uh, it's it's hard to say. I mean, we, we have sort of publicly available information yeah, about true, yeah. what they can do. Um, they certainly have all of the ingredients to have this sort of pervasive surveillance network uh, where you not only have uh, one type of surveillance technology, you have a whole arsenal of surveillance technologies and they are networking among themselves so that you can cross-check a person's, um, you know, face as seen in a, a one CCTV camera and pick up their location wherever else they've appeared in front of a camera. You can also find out what their social credit score is and uh, who they are associated with on social media and what they're saying, you know, on their, on their cell phone. Um, that entails a pretty big dose of automation, uh, which is uh, sometimes easier said than done. Um, similar efforts uh, to develop sort of fully fused network systems elsewhere have at times run into trouble just because of the, the, the challenges of, of, of bringing together all of this disparate information. Um, but China is suddenly at the forefront whereas they weren't a few years ago. I mean, even just their uh, their CCTV manufacturers have gone from being really minor players in the global industry just a few years ago to being market leaders. I mean, there are dozens of countries that now, even in official capacity, operate Chinese-made uh, CCTV cameras, many of which are now coming standard equipped with degrees of automation, detecting suspicious activities, say, facial recognition, detecting when a door is left open, say, uh, detecting if people are fighting. Um, and this is just the beginning. I mean, if this is where China is after just a couple of years of really focusing on this technology, uh, one can only imagine where they might go next. Yeah, I, I feel like we're, uh, we're writing another episode of Black Mirror right now. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> but yet it's... But yet it's now. So, uh, Arthur Holland, Michelle, uh, you've written an awesome book. Uh, once again, it is Eyes in the Sky, The Secret Rise of Gorgon Stare and How It Will Watch Us All. And uh, just a fascinating read. I, I love it. In, from the pers especially from the perspective of just what technology is enabling it and that that constant struggle between like just because we can should we uh mm -hmm. you know that that question and this is definitely one of those instances where it makes sense that technology has evolved to this point but uh should should we have enabled it to get there maybe it was inevitable uh but we're there now and i'm be really curious to see where this develops the next 15 to 20 years especially and i know you will be too you'll probably do a follow-up yeah. at some point yeah. following this yeah, closely it, it already feels that way Absolutely. yeah and and rapidly so maybe in just mm -hmm. a couple of years uh arthur hall and michelle thank you so much for hopping on with me today i appreciate oh, no, it it's been a real pleasure I really appreciate it awesome and you can find him at at right arthur on twitter as well uh best of luck with the with the book release all right. Thanks so much, Jason. We do this show. Uh, normally we do this show. Well, we we kind of switch the time sometimes. Normally we do it on Friday. I'm recording this a little bit earlier, but Fridays, 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 11.30 a.m. Pacific, 18.30 UTC. You can watch it live by going to twit.tv slash live at those times. We'll record it live. If we're doing it in a different time, we'll usually throw it up on the live stream as well like we did today. Uh, but if you want to you know, subscribe to the show, which is what most people do, you can go to, to the show's homepage, twit.tv slash TRI or twit.tv slash triangulation to make it easier. There you will find all of the interviews that we've done over the years, um, right around just just over 400 at this point. We're right around 404 right now. And uh, each and every interview is there 
easy to find, lots of fascinating stuff to, to catch up on. If you uh, have the time, you can start at episode one and play through the entire lot. Uh, but I love doing this show, so thanks for allowing me to, to, uh, to come on each time I'm on and do triangulation. And uh, that's it for this week. Thanks to Anthony for producing this episode. And until next time, we'll see you then on triangulation. Bye, everybody.